Let's, uh, you know, we preached down through verse number five this morning, and uh, I think if there's ever anything Paul wrote that just kind of, man, gets a hold of your heart, really, you look down into the soul of this man, it's verses number six and seven. He said, for I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I mean, he just got through giving Timothy this last charge down through verse five, and he said, for I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. If I didn't really take that passage of Scripture in its wider context, I'd think, boy, Paul, you're getting awful uh, uh, me, I, 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 I about life. Because he says, I this, and I that, and I this, and I that. And uh, yet he's the one who wrote, uh, wasn't it Romans chapter 6? It has so many eyes in it, you know. Uh, chapter 7, I was going to believe chapter 7. But anyway, all the eyes, and, and eyes usually the problem. But here he's about ready to leave out of life. Now, remember, he's in, in prison, and he's really, really close to being executed, uh, close to being leaving this world. And he says, I'm now ready to be offered. And, and I, this is just to me one of the most descriptive passages of Scripture. And uh, the, re, the, the fact that he used the word I in there so much, to me, it, it, it's something I think we need to get. A, I think it makes it personal. You know, you die personal. You know, Karen can stand by my bedside, but I'm going to have to die personal. Judgment is personal. And there is personal accountability. And... Uh, but Paul here shows, I think, somewhat of the view of his life. Notice the first thing he said, I'm now ready to be offered. That word offered is the same word that goes back to the Old Testament of the drink offerings that were poured out before the Lord. And what is a drink offering? Now, here, what's this? The drink offering, they didn't just take half of it and pour it out. The idea was to take it all and pour it out. How many members of the woman who came to Jesus in the alabaster box? She had something precious, and she broke it beyond regathering, and she poured it out. And that's a picture of how our lives are lead at Christ. We're to be broken, and we're to be spilled out. This is what the Apostle Paul was saying. He's saying, I'm ready. He said, he said I, I want my life to be an offering to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember when the three men broke through to the Philistines, David's mighty men? Got him a drink out of the well of Bethlehem, brought it back. What did David do with it? Poured it out. And the essence here is this. And here's the picture of of what Paul's writing here is this. A life poured out for Jesus Christ. Didn't hold anything back. You know what he's saying? I gave it all. I gave it all. I poured my life out for Jesus. Do you know, I really believe that lost people... And the world in general, if they could see Christians pouring it all out. If they could see them give, you know, uh, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice for Jesus Christ. If they could say, you know what, that guy, that lady, it's, it's not about them. They've poured out their life for the cause of Jesus Christ. Uh, I tell you, I can't get over that missionary who was here the other night, Brother Bob Johnson. I'm going to tell you something, folks. That's pouring your life out. That family we watched on the city, you know, taking your family to Africa. You're pouring your life out. Everything they could have done and could have been over here in the United States poured out. You ever think about that? Everything, all the dreams and, you know, what do you think they, you know, Brother Bob was a Illinois pig farmer. What do you think he dreamed of being when he was 13, 14, 15, 17, 18 years old? What was he going to do with his life? Now, Jesus said this, whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake in the gospel, the same will save it. When you pour your life out for the cause of Christ, you're not going to lose your life. That's why the, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastic. He said, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this, that. He got it all. He says, vanity and vexation of spirit makes me sick to look at it. It's nothing but a pain to me. He says, well, riches increase, they that eat them increase. You don't know if anybody really loves you. You've got so much stuff, you know where they like you because of what you got. And when you pour your life out for Christ, you just don't lose it. You, and what he's saying here, I have, I'm now ready to be offered. Now watch this. So he looks at it as a poured out offering. Second thing, he looks at his life as a 
And that's really neat to me because he's going back to the Old Testament and he's saying, he's looking at his life as an offering presented to God. Second thing, he's looking at his life as a departing ship. Look what it says there. Time of my departure is at hand. You know what that departed, he said there, there ain't no ropes tied to the docks. You think about that. I wonder how, much, I wonder how tight our ropes are tied to the docks. And, well, there's so much stuff in this thing about how we really ought to be looking at life. I mean, what's tying you to the docks? He said, he said time my departure is at hand. You know, Paul said to die is gain. He had a right perspective. And uh, so he's, he's looking at it as a, as a, a t- as, as look like a departing ship. And then the next thing he says, I have, uh, he said, uh, I have fought a good fight. He looks at his life as a wrestling match. You know, and that's true. The Bible said, for we wrestle. Mm. Like it or not, you're going to wrestle. You're going to be, you saved, you're going to wrestle. You don't have an option. Now, you may flop on the floor and say, I give up, devil. But you're going to wrestle. You're going to get into it. And uh, he looked at his life as a wrestling match. He said, I fought a good fight. And I want to tell you something. Uh, this does not mean that he necessarily was a good fighter, although he was. Let me tell you the secret is fighting the fight worth fighting. Everybody seems to be fighting for something, but are you fighting for a fight that's worth fighting? Are you fighting for a cause that's worth fighting? David said, is there not a cause when he went to Goliath? You know what the first thing David had to do? Is this, is this, is this fight worth getting into? You know, there's some things... I, you ever heard the saying, I ain't got a dog in this race. I ain't got a dog in this fight. There's some things you just... You know, Jesus said, He that walketh by meddling with the affairs that don't belong to him is like a man who goes by and grabs a dog by the ears. There's some things you just want to... It ain't worth it, folks. There's some things that's not worth getting, you're spending your energy and your emotion and stuff on. What he's saying here is that I spent my energy. I fought a fight that was worth fighting in my life. And I'm telling you about your faith and your family. And our freedom is a fight worth fighting. Amen. There are some things that maybe are not that important, but there are some things that you... Because here's the deal. You want to be able to look back like he's saying, all right, my ship's heading out. When you look back down the road of your life, you need to really be able to say, I fought a fight that was worth fighting. I didn't spend my time fighting a bunch of junk that wasn't doing anybody any good, didn't have any eternal values here. Now, this guy teaches something about living and teaches something about dying if you look at it real close. So he's looking at it as a wrestling match. And then he looks at his life as having been a guardian of a treasure. Look what he says there. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. And these, this is what I want to get on here tonight. And I just want to do this uh, uh, real quickly and get you out. But I think, I think it will help us. He said, I found my, he said, I, he said, I finished my course. You know what he did? First of all, he found his course. In Acts chapter 13, uh, the Bible speaks, uh, where he said, I finished so that I might finish my course with joy. And this, I studying this afternoon, it put a whole new realm of thinking on me. You know what this, this finish my course is relating to? I remember years ago taking the kids up to the state, uh, uh, well, not the prison, but the state playoffs, uh, convention, state convention. And one of the, and something that I never, <laughs> that's okay, that's all right. And one of the things that really, really got my attention, and, and the funny thing about it is I never thought much about this because I never ran it. But what are those races where they have four guys and they're all staggered? Relay race. Did you know that Paul, when he's saying, I finished my course, is talking about in terminology of a race that I had a part in this race, and I did my part. I remember, how many ever been in a relay race or seen a relay race where one of the four guys was just talked into doing it? He really didn't want to run, but they told him, says, if you don't run, we can't even participate. So he's, okay, he's going to do it. And he really doesn't care if he finishes. He's just doing it to help his buddies get in the race. But what Paul is saying here that I took the baton, you know who he took it from? He took it from the Lord Jesus Christ. You know who he really picked it up from? Stephen. The Apostle Paul picked up the baton from Stephen, and he carried it till he was sitting in Nero's jail. And you know what he was doing to Timothy? He was handing it off. 
I want my daddy to help me tonight. Now, daddy, would you care to stand up and help me? I'm not going to ask you to run, daddy. I'm not going to ask you to run. Okay, now, I have here tonight uh, another son, Zach. I have a son here, Zachary. Zachary's got a little boy back there. And God's picturing your families and our life like this. Now, I'm going to hand, uh, daddy, just use my Bible here tonight if you don't care. Daddy, I'm going to stand over here a ways. So Zachary, I want you to get, and I don't know if you can get Jack to participate in this or not. But uh, you stand back here at the back, Zachary. And, and uh, Jackson, could you come up here to Grandpa? Would you care to come up here to Grandpa? Can you come up here? Help Grandpa? Come help Grandpa, okay? You come stand about right up here, okay, buddy? He's checking this thing out. He says, I wonder what's going on. There you go. That's good, right there. Can you stand right here? Put your hand right there. Wait for Daddy, okay? All righty. Now, Daddy, I want you to bring the, the Bible to me. And here's the picture. Dad is carried down. He's 85 years old. And he's been carrying it. Now, watch this. He's passing it off. He's, he's, he kept the faith. Amen. You know what? He's 85 years old now. He's still in church. Amen. He's not sitting down at the house saying, I'm tired. I, I don't want to go. He may be saying that, but he's still going. <laughs> I'm sure there's times when his knees don't want to get up and go to church. But he's, he's passed it on to me. Amen. Now, it's my job, however long God gives me, to take it to Zach. And I'm, Paul said, I have what? And what did that do? He finished his course. Right. And I'm to finish my course. Right. And when, I'm, when, I, when, I, when, when my, the time of my departure is at hand, I need to have handed off to these boys something that's real. I don't need to get to be 80 and say, boys, I don't know. I tell you what, that's a big joke, church. You know, and just be out mad at everybody and bitter at the world and quit church and quit the ministry. All right, Zach, you're supposed to pass it on. To your son. Can you bring Grandpa his Bible? Thank you. Boy, I appreciate it. He's ready to go again. He's ready to go another lap. This is what Paul's talking about. So tonight, I want you to do something with me. Let's try this. Um, Brother Ralph, I want to see you pass off the faith to one of your sons. you got a son here tonight sitting across somewhere, a daughter. You know what? You ought to pass it off. You ought to just, you ought to just get up and take a lap around and say, you know what? By God's grace, I'm going to finish my course. I'm going to hand this faith over to you. He said, I've kept the faith. i finished my course. And I tell you, this is the tragedy. The beatingest thing I've ever seen. Is I'll tell you, the devil will do a backdoor number on you. He'll get you bitter at life. He, you know, I'm going to tell you something. Your kids ought to see you die joyfully in the Lord. Amen. Still holding up the bloodstained banner with an eye on eternity. And just carry that faith. I tell you, the most precious thing we'll ever do is just what Paul's doing to Timothy right here. Is be able to say, you know, uh, the time my departure is at hand, I've kept the faith, finished my course. You know what? How many of you looking at a race tonight would think about a guy, and here he is. He, he takes off running his lap. He gets about halfway to the next guy, and he just stops, throws the baton out off the field, walks off the field. Leaves that buddy, leaves that brother standing down there with nobody bringing it to him. And that's what many of the childs had done to him. He's had his daddy stop in the middle of the race. Throw the baton on the coffee table of life and never show up for his own son. Never show up for his own daughter. And I just want to encourage us tonight, finish your race. Finish your course. Keep the faith. Pass it on. Some of you young people tonight need to make up your mind right now. Right now. God be my helper. If he ever gives me any children, I'm going to pass it on to them. I'm thankful for my mom and dad tonight. I hope the Lord comes back. Because I wouldn't look forward to coming to church and not 
see my mom and dad. You get used to it. But I will say mom and dad to you, I thank you for keeping the faith. Amen. Passing it on to me. Paul said, so that I might finish my course with joy. Amen. Finish my course with joy back over in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. That means he ran the entire race. I uh, I get tickled. Uh, I don't get tickled. I get amazed over the years how many people I, I see come and go out of churches. I, I want to give you... And I just want to go home tonight. I just want to give you something. The most precious thing that you mom and daddies are going to do here is just be faithful to God and to God's house. And you may think, well, it's not doing much good, but I'll tell you something, they can't, the devil can't rob that from your kids. When they see that you've been faithful, that you've kept the faith, that you've finished your course, that you've run your race, you know, Paul wrote over in the book of Hebrews, over in chapter 12, talking about, uh, let us, uh, I can't even quote it right now. Let's go over there, Hebrews chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run, the pa- run with patience the race that is set before us. You know what's happened in America? had a lot of daddies that didn't take it to their sons. And that son didn't take it to his son. And that son didn't... Some, somebody dropped the, dropped the faith. And that's why there's people... You, you know what? People, America's full of people who got... Well, uh, boy, my grandma, she was a godly woman. Well, what about not grandma? What about you? What about mama? And uh, here's some things... He's, you know, he, this is an old thing, but he said, he said, lay aside every weight. So if you're going to run a good race, there's some things you may have to lay off. There may have to be some things you get rid of. I mean, it's one thing to get up here and demonstrate Dad to me and me to Zach and Zach to Jack. But while I'm running my race, there may be some things, and I've had to get rid of some things in my life. You know, some things weren't all that bad, just things God said, Reg, you can't do. Reg, you, you can't. You know, there's a difference between good and excellent. There might be some things that are not necessarily evil, but they're just things that I've had to lay aside because time is very short and you can only do so much in life. And there's some things you may, it's not because it's wicked or terrible or something. You just, you just, there's some things. Some, I had a guy ask and say, what do you do for recreation? I don't know. I guess work and study and go to church. I guess this is my recreation. <laughs> I don't know, you know. But he said, lay, lay aside some weights. You know, there may be things that's not, uh, the old illustration, you've seen them baseball players come up to the deal, to, to the, what they call that on deck, and they're swinging them things, they've got donuts on the bat. Now, there's nothing wrong with swinging a bat with donuts on it when you're on deck, but it's pretty stupid when you get in a batter's box. You're to lay aside those weights. You ever seen anybody get in a race and come up there with old barn boots on and overhauls and, and every winter bit, of, bit of winter clothing they've got on and say, man, I'm going to run a race? No, no, no. Man, they get, you know what, they lay aside stuff. Well, if we was going to go out here tonight and have you said, Reggie, we're going to have a $500 race, I'd jump in right in the middle of it. I might lose, but I'd jump right in the middle of it. And I guarantee you what, I'd probably take off this coat right here, and I'd get down, and I'd, get, I'd take everything out of my pockets, and I want nothing hindering me because I want to win that race. And that's what God is saying. saying. So he said, hey, if stuff in your home and stuff in your life is hindering you from running a race that you ought to run, get rid of some of that stuff. doesn't mean it's terrible. doesn't mean it's wicked. Just lay some things apart. That's not doing you any good. I'm telling you, one of the best things I did, and you know, and I, I've wrestled with over years. One of the best things, I don't, I wouldn't. A, a TV will just rip me up. Now you might be able to watch one, but I'll go. Oh my land! Them stupid idiots! Pull that piece of me, man! And first thing I know, I'm just in Lulu land over watching TV. Now you know what? I think Barney Fife's the greatest guy in the world to watch. I love to watch Andy Griffith. But you know what? I could miss time with God and miss what God has for me watching Andy Griffith. It ain't that that's so bad. It's lay aside. If, it's a, if it becomes a weight to me that's, not, that's hindering my race, I might ought to get rid of it. And uh, 
then you need to keep your eyes right. Amen. You know what? Do you ever know this that a coach, what will a coach do if he's, you're running a race like this and you're all the time running like this? First thing, you're going to run off the track if you're careful. <laughs> run into the fence. What did Jesus say? The Bible said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish your faith. You, if you're going to finish your course, just like Dad to me, to Zach Smith, you've got to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. You can't get your eyes on the preacher. You cannot get your eyes on your relatives. You can't get your eyes on other Christians. I'll be honest with you, I talked to a man today who's in a spiritual mess. You know why his trouble it really is? Got his eyes off Jesus. Got his eyes on everybody else. You know, all he can see is the, is the, is the, uh, by the way, are there any perfect people in this church? (laughs) All he can see is the bad in other people. The unspirituality of other people. You know what the trouble is? Got his eyes off Jesus. God never told me to, you know, to look to you and, you know, keep, get my eyes on you. He said, get your eyes on you. The fact of it is, Jesus never said, look at me. If I look at myself, all I can see is weakness and failure and sin and wickedness. But if I get my eyes on Jesus Christ, I don't tell you what, you get your eyes on the Lord, it'll help you finish your course. It'll help you keep the faith. It'll help you deliver that faith to the next generation. But you get your eyes on a bunch of other stuff, you won't do it. Paul said, run it with patience, too. Remember, he's saying over here in Timothy, he's saying, I've finished my course. But you go back in Hebrews chapter 12, he said, run it with patience. Hmm. Mm. Patience. There are there are so many times when I just want to walk off the track and go and just sit down. Just let somebody else run for a while. You ever get like that? Just you know, you know, you've got a lot of fifty dash wonders. They can really cut that 50-yard dash. But the Christian life is a marathon. And that's what I'm getting to here. You want to see that fourth generation have the faith? You've got to run it with patience. Patience. It ain't always going to be easy. It's not always going to be exciting. I come into church sometimes, you know, and I'm just like... And I see other people like that. But it's just running with patience. You know how you get there? One foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. Sunday night, Sunday morning. Wednesday night, Sunday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night. You just keep on running it with patience. You know, you just keep reading your Bible. When it seems like you're not getting anything out of it, you keep praying. When it seems like the prayer ain't getting no higher than your head, you keep praying. Did you know that your prayers are not dependent upon how you feel about your prayer? They're dependent upon the name of Jesus Christ. You pray anyway. And just keep praying with patience. And you know, you're going to go through some bad times. You're going to go through winter times in your, you're going to go through winter times in your spiritual experience. You're going to go through times in your life when the leaves are gone. And the walnuts have dropped. And the squirrels is getting them. <laughs> and they just seem like there's nothing there. And you're going to go through times when you seem like, man alive, I plowed this garden up and I planted my seed and it's all for nothing. And everything you put your heart and labor into seems like it's, it don't amount to anything. You've got to just run with patience. Patience, patience. Patience, thou art a virtue because of thy scarcity. The Bible said Jesus, who the joy is set before him. So anyway, I just want to say this to you tonight. Um, finish your course. Keep the faith. And remember, there's somebody standing in front of you that's hoping you'll finish And get to him with the Word of God. Okay? I know I didn't have a whole lot for you tonight. I hope it helped you. But, you know, I've got one consuming desire. That is, I want all my kids saved. I want all my grandchildren saved. I want every descendant of mine that ever is born in this world saved, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I want them to go to heaven. And I want to I want to hand this off to him. There's enough, you know. I, it, I'm not. It's it's not a matter of how good I am or nice I am or all that kind of. Stuff. I just want to finish my course. I want to finish it out. I want to keep the faith. You say, Reg, is this real important? Do you know how many old preachers quit believing what they preached all their life? Multitudes of them. 
I'm going to tell you something. Satan is very, very subtle. He can come in late in life and just mess you up like nobody's business. I've seen it. Finish your course. Keep the faith. It's a personal thing. you got to do it. Say, Reggie, how do you do that? Well, it's one thing to say it. I want to encourage you. Read the Bible with your wives and your, ch- your family, folks. Read your Bibles together. Pray together. You know what? I have a... I'll tell you what I'd do if I was doing it over again. Nathan, I'd come up and pray with you at your bedside more. You and Zach and Ben. I'd made a trip upstairs instead of studying for a message to the heart out of... I'd have laid my notes aside. I'd have walked up the stairs and sat down by the bedside of my boys and said, How you doing, boys? Let's pray together before you go to sleep tonight. I think they would remember that better than my preaching. Your kids is going to remember. I had a man tell me one time, he said, Reggie, he said, I never remember a night when I was growing up as a boy in my home that my daddy didn't come upstairs and sit down and have prayer with me. And that man's serving God and has went through a lot of fire in his life. Lost a son at a young, at a young age. But his dad handed off to him a faith that he believed in. It wasn't a Sunday morning deal. It wasn't an outward observance. It was something that's real in his heart. And... When I got this picture of this course where Paul was, had reached, took it from Stephen, handing it to Timothy, and I got to thinking about our families and our homes. Boy, we've got to pass it off. Folks, listen, if, you don't, if we don't do it, I ain't got a hope. Well, I love you.